All right, hey, so this is the third recording of Embedded Contradiction, an issuance of dissonance into contemporary philosophy, an introduction to modular truth, starting on this particular uh, chapter, Possible Perspectives. Transcendental signifier seems to refer not to a correspondence between signifier and empirical signified, but to say that the phonic word as signifier is always transcendent among common language speakers, users, like platonic forms. I mention this to defame theologists who speak of the laws of logic as being an expression of God in such a way to diminish that all other logos are not an expression of God, to defame their adherence to the idea that God knows all true propositions, and that the laws of logic are par excellence, the rules from which truth is derived, and by nature of God true. This theist argument makes truth a virtue, and virtue akin to the nobility of God. To them, I speak of the transcendent signifiers in such a way as to say God knows all. This includes all true and false propositions. Therefore, God also knows all false arguments. A follow-up to this is to speak of the redundancy of the theist who argues with a sincere presumption that they themselves are not lying and not contradicting themselves when in debate or discourse with a secular atheist, or by they, the theist, insists upon understanding their argument, opponent's argument and showing it to be false or incoherent. The act of understanding their opponent's argument to wrangle with it when they whom presume it to be a false argument would require that if God knew the thoughts of all men, that God would also know the understandings of the theists understanding their opponent's false argument, such that it would be fair to say that a God knows the mind of the theist to know the mind false mind of their opponent, then God also knows all false arguments, no? I wouldn't bring this up as an apophactic inversion of the common theist assumption that the atheist is skirting the truth of the theist claim when claiming that God knows all true propositions in order to stand clear of defaming God with falsity, false knowledges. There are many paraconsistent logics which detail possible intersections with contradiction whilst still remaining coherent. Alex Malpass, Intersection Response. I don't see how you could literally perceive spiritual reality. Do you see it or smell it? If it isn't a sense like this, then what is it? You say that your experience of spiritual reality carries with it the conviction that God is truly revealing himself to humans, how can an experience carry with it a conviction? You could experience something you take to be God, and you could be convinced that the experience is true, but you cannot experience a conviction. The idea is unintelligible to me. So at best, you have an experience that prima facie, face, prima facie, seems like it is of spiritual reality, and you go with it. So, say a voice says to you, Matt, this is God talking. My intention is for you to believe in me. It seems to you that this is a perception of spiritual reality and you go with it. The question is, have you interpreted it correctly? You may say that you have and that it is obvious what it means as to say what its intentions are but maybe the intentions of the sender of the message are to trick you about its intentions. Or maybe it's trying to get you to figure out a secret message. Maybe it's testing you, like Job was tested. How do you rule out these interpretations? 
I don't see how your experience of spiritual reality helps at all, as the problems remain even if you grant that you really are experiencing a message from spiritual reality and haven't had your drink spiked, etc. My response to Alex's words above, below. I don't regularly stick up for biblical theists, but in this case, and now that I have seen your negotiated conversation with Jack about authorial intent, where you speak of Witters, Wittgenstein's private language argument, slightly when mentioning that language is released to the public domain, such as to imply that the reader is an integral, integral as the intent of the author, but being skirted by Jack at this point suggests that you are aware of a reconsideration here. Couldn't a biblical theist suggest that deactic expression picked up from the reader of the text coincides significantly with yet a greater context of the subject, reader, perhaps as an accent to imbue a non-secular signification? This you read a horror novel by a fire where the novel speaks of one one's house lighting on fire and just then a spark snaps loudly or a fire engine drives by giving ambience to the experience or suppose you're watching a movie where one's relative is on their deathbed and with only slight diachronic distinction your phone rings and your parent or sibling informs you of your other parent's death, such that irony doesn't escape you, such that the uncanny parallel is given significance whereby the subject is convicted by the familial trusting. Is not this type of trust a context to accent the subject's conviction? And is it not the coinciding double tap understanding take on a different level significance than if the information was delivered without coincidence. This above description is part and parcel of what a spiritual conviction could be understood as, no? The idea that the perceiver is being tricked by an accent within their environmental field is akin to a subject ignoring or denying any significance to said accent. See Wittgenstein's Aspect Blindness. Dialetheism requires a dialectical interaction via discussion within community between two or more language speakers. One might come to a spiritual solipsism and say, yet all is but a discussion between me and myself, all others being a reflection of myself. Here's a diagram at this point. At the top we have anleotheism, neither true nor false, indicated by a Venn diagram of A intersecting not A, where part of the intersection is divided as the gap, or the anleothe, and that is denoted logically as uh, bracket left bracket not A, left parenthetical A and not A, right parenthetical right bracket. It's considered a gap. Below that we have what is uh, dialetheism, or both true and false, which is a glute. And we have left bracket A, left parenthetical A and not A, right parenthetical right bracket. Dialetheism and anleotheism have as much to do with contradictions as they have to do with Diana as theism or Diana as goddess. In other words, when one dabbles and informs themselves of the possibilities of what may be found within their seeking process into contradictions, one is inevitably able to come to this rub. Basically, as a modern philosopher who's as modern philosophers who study and practice notions of the Dileothe, like Graham Priest, we find that he levels the dilemmas of the Dileothe at such things as the liar's paradox, to denote the paradox as a Dileothe. And 
will also speak about someone in motion exiting and entering a domain whereby stating the truth or falsity of them uh, existing in one domain or another is found within the intersection so that they, that is the person moving through the space, is both in and not in X and Y domains at the same time, like crispicular organisms. Yet the rub is denoting the domain of the true contradiction as viable within historic logical formulations as noted above as one domain of consideration about dialetheism and the most modern notion of logical explosion where all trivial truths are true, where all explosions are noted. The second type of dialetheism requires that there is a contradiction. There is logical explosion. Then there are all conceivable, conceivable trivialities which are true. And then the containment of the explosion. First one must note that the requirement to discover one's involvement with understanding the second form of true contradiction or standing held contradictions may, if one em emphasizes, empathizes with the idea too much, will drive them into atomic madness. So be it, if one is to read my words and embark on a self-discovery into the realm of all things being possible, and by possible I mean true, then this requires one to discover their very own conceptual and psychological limitations. If one is to embark in this investigation and go beyond the limits of language, as Wittgenstein asserts is the case, then one must be willing to lose their own identity. I simply ask the reader to partake in the madness, but not to, but not yield at the point of murder or suicide. The intersection between dialetheism as paradox and dialetheism as contained logical explosion is itself a dialethe and one that I, as the author, personally embark on in order to move through all boundaries of taking in the entirety of one's universe as it is granted to your being. By your, I mean the locus of the I, which one calls and limits themselves. Oddly enough, another contradiction is found when dismantling one's ego, breaking out of their shell, recovering themselves within the remnants of their shell, and then unlike a, a crustaceous organism, the human in human spirit finds that they are beyond themselves, where upon a second, third, or many reapproaches to themselves, they find that they, after having gotten into madness, are not a self at all, but that they are, you are one, is all things, a perennial view. One is the most conceivable things. One is all conceivable things. Hence, at this point, the idea of the self or identity is a myth. A myth of Zen or the all-connected, all-integral. A religious side note, when facing po a possible insanity of personalizing contradictions, it is important to calcify oneself from the domain of bodily death or behaving with the freedom to murder another, as the first act dissolves away the bios, the temple, the body itself, and leaves nothing more to achieve on this plane, planet where the second murder is a type of self-slaying, as one's soul will forever radiate the harshest, most monstrous beings that they may become, as if all other things were mirrors of oneself and one decides to demolish that mirror. Well, the soul would contain that echoed horror for its future duration, whereby only indefinite forgiveness in and within a Christian ethic of being forgiven for one's sins, both past, present, and future, would need to be employed and clung to to recover balance and orientation. 
left parenthetical domain, left parenthetical intersection, right parenthetical x domain, where x equals negation. So domain, intersection, the negation of domain. Foundationalism is a stopping of all possible further interpretations of the world. An example of anglotheism is space poverty, which I heard about from John Oliver's last week show. It's neither true nor false. A fun example of dialetheism is a car painted red at in the dark. An argument ensues about whether the car is red or is not, as it's obviously, observably, is not. The idea that the car is red is both true and false. Chapter Monopoly Us, or Monopoly Us. Monopoly Us. Mono, the shell of pragmatism. When one finds there being to be more a mechanism of movement derived to survive and maintain its course of practical conduct, to feed itself, to clean itself, its offspring, its community, then one is within the pragmatic domain. Poly, the openness to myth, meaning, and the other. When all conceived notions of meaning, whether fantastical, imaginary, mystical, unlikely, impossible, become possible, in conception firstly, and then in empathy secondly. To your being, you become expansive, inclusive of all other minds, artifacts, doings, and meanings. When one accepts the meaning of the self as a plurality of self, then they are within the mythic domain. When meta-meanings, pluralities, subtexts become relevant to the individual monad, then the monad becomes poly. Interpreting the world of projected symbols above and beyond a naturalistic read is a point of departure away from the ground. The ground is reference to items as objects, tools of utility opposed to objects of meaning, objects as meaning. Recamping one's paradigm from its original fixation occurs. About at this time, a psychotic person yields their mind to professional help, namely a shrink. Us, U.S. Yet the pragmatic and mythic cases are held in general healthy balance at this stage. This is the limit of the modern dialetheistic like Professor Priest. And beyond this healthy balance is the Rubicon, the bigger rub. When one allows their mind to open to the fullness of being and intersects the ontology, pragmatic, with the plurality of all possible meanings, mythos, in the third movie, The Matrix, the Smith program emerges from The Matrix into the sub-real realm of Zion and blinds Neo in the flesh, prior to both Neo and the Smith program dispensing with their war and Neo's death into the computer city of wires. Once intersected, lead one from monism to neutral monism, whereby one's being bonds with non-duality and becomes all beings and all meanings. This is the S domain. At first, this domain may haunt the waking soul, frighten it, or in many cases, like a butterfly just coming out of its cocoon, it needs to flap and air its wings. Then the soul is free to fly, but to where? What is, what is its mystery and path, and at what point, if any, does the path of the soul, this butterfly, become a pathos? Its pitiful rebuke against all of the cosmos has brought it to be? Or does the human soul reach its zenith and pervade through all manner of conduct, whether masochism to the tenth degree or murder of another soul? One's most intolerable intoler mirrored opposite. The butterfly wishing... It could be a hookah-smoking caterpillar once again.
The distraction between the mythic world and the pragmatic world is an artifice. I attempt to reinsert into my being in order to segue into the pragmatic landscape and parse away this the mythic, a.k.a. meaning of concepts, notions, thoughts, ideas which lay beyond the mundane and practical. Now is free to compare this meaning of the self alongside that which one moves the components of their being through time, namely their body, in the most object-oriented practical way, namely how your body moves within its space of objects in order to facilitate its own self-survival. The mythos and the mythic are to subside at bay here for some time, but soon the torrent of rains and weather and corridors to one's safe space will be washed over them once again, as the Rubicon has been crossed. The butterfly cannot go back to its caterpillar state per se. The only reenact a cocooning stage, and only reenact a cocooning stage, it may waft here and hope that the gods don't pluck its wings off in order to imitate the groundlessness, the groundedness of the non-flying caterpillar. Like the boy who holds his finger in the dam to prevent the water racing through, demolishing the city of his home, he waits there until the city is alerted and vacated, as a grand exodus, prior to uncorking his finger. So dileotheism is by itself a dangerous category of non-utility for one's philosophical soul to migrate into, namely because of the above-mentioned and not to mention that the dear love friend of wisdom, aka as philosophy, will inject and include the harsh, painful darkness of the unwise, yet exalted at times in one's mind. Chapter. The Exalted as E Pluribus Unum. From out of many, one. Here a homo sapien finds themselves to be a style of being within the aquarium of the cosmos. The one is the one, the center, the true I am. But exactly what is this being? that is, and is not, yet is. Who has emerged from its genetic and imaginative possibility? What does it believe itself to be? Quantity itself as an analytic is the hardest epistemic ideal to which to find a contradiction too, yet it is displaced into a primordial type of consideration, that of the haptic sense of touch, the texture and form of an item grasped by the human hand as an experimental iteration before it becomes a reiteration, a felt sensed cognition prior to a recognition, a member grasped prior to a non-analytic remembering. What is called one or oneness, what is considered as two or two-ness, is hard to negotiate around. As the idea, the signified rests of itself in my mind. I have no qualms with denying quality as it is projected to empirical examples in the world, then can be suspended in doubt and in parameter, ambiguation, but quantity in the mind seems to hold tightly as such. Yet the signified, the mental image or mental supplement of two-ness or oneness, etc., is not fixed. For I can imagine oneness in many variant ways. The magnetism of focus and focal points and their un- Reconcilable distinction. Each moment when one is well set within their natural body, one's senses pick up on specific spatial, visual, auditory, and tactile elements. Our eyes focus on one area or domain, thing or item, and then move to the next moment of focus. 
Sometimes a clattered, obfuscated domain is the referent of one's visual focus. One might go slightly cross-eyed or close the aperture of their pupils as to blur their vision and focus on the blur in and of itself. The auditory realm allows hearing-abled humans to most often locate the source of friction and frequency in orientation to their cranium as well as its distance. Sometimes, though, one can listen to the cacophony of fuzzy white noise, ambient sounds, or be lost within an echo. One may pass into sleep while listening to what once was clear and now is background in general. When one passes through the crispicular realm into the next other domain, awake to sleep, relaxed to alerted, happy to sad, focused to unclear, night into day, day into night, etc., the new tonal quality of being is allowed to set in, which attunes itself with the nature of the being which seeks to find itself as itself. Humans are often told that we are by nature diurnal creatures, and most human affairs happen during the day, and most humans sleep at night, yet we all also know that some of us, any of us, can sleep and wake at any time during the day or night. A fully awakened soul has one's non-reluctance to walk extensively uncovered in rain without repent or dislike. First finds its freedom and its play, and then it finds its current and its flock, its type and subtype. Its species within a species is tribe, like lion packs or wolves, like birds of a feather. And separated off from that is the unum, the one, the whole confident and complete. Which hill are you going to die for on? A teacher once asked the class, asked me within the class, simply just ask me amongst the class, amongst the cosmos. Some die for love, some die for honor, some die by pity and self-resolve, some flee from war, some trade, some steal, some die of age and organ failure, some are nailed to wood, burnt, drowned, or otherwise. My robust soul says to not die, to confidently engage all with no fear, yet, like Superman, an Achilles heel as kryptonite exists. Like the blind spot in the in an eyeball that isn't easily recognized as the other eye sees what the one doesn't. The mind registers it all as being seen, yet there's always each being's weakness. And if it isn't found, then time itself will become that weakness. The mere sponsorship of this type of writing writing invokes the universe to feed aspects of itself into me. A fire sign came and went, pointing to me. When one recognizes that their eyes settle on specific items and things, and that those things may have meaning, um, have meaning, the meaning one is capable of ascribing to what one sees, then they may follow their world as a fishbowl aquarium which guides them to understand who they are, what is possibly at stake, and for what they may decide to be what they fight for, flee from, but ultimately die for and from. Biblical Contradiction The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Revelation 17, 8. So how is something and how isn't something? If someone asks me if I believe or understand them, to be an independent organism than myself, I may answer, 
both yes and no. I may have a solipsistic mask to which the other organism is merely a data set which has come into my frame of reference and is no more real than a hologram. And yet the behaviorist part of me sees that I am responding to the inquiry made by the organism of data sets such as to granted importance, a value of importance enough to care to respond at all as I remain a fair-weathered carnivore. Even the idea of manufacturing value in a valueless world is a type of upheaval that I grant myself in order to play a perceived future role within the dynamic of consistence, time-oriented yet possibly arbitrary data sets. On the other hand, the organism, data set asking the question, is also conceived as an organism. So both that experience is both of another organism and a data set where the difference between the two options is discrete at a time such that the x variable in question, namely the data set or organism, are not considered one variable. So x is not x, not merely x. In another case we grant our senses as sensing something and that something is the organism and behave and believe as the data set is another like organism and respond as such. In this case, a discrete difference between data set and organism is semi-permeable. X is both an organism and a data set where X remains X. No contradiction arises. The cleave between variables, the notion of difference, and unique come into play. For, for conversation's sake, sense and rationality require that distinction and the difference be made. The Zen practitioner assumes all senses and sense data and data sets are but one. That difference itself is the illusion and not required to reach the singularity of the universe, the uni of universe. The ontological one-time occurrence, one path, one movement of one's consciousness through time, both bodied and unembodied, its perception of time, its perception of its beginning or end. This differs from recognizing difference, more than one difference and the extension of all that is, outbound and away from the center of consciousness, different and hence independent from oneself. Some theologies preach a pre-existence or a reincarnation such that the consciousness or soul travels infinitely in different bodies, planes, or dimensions, and it merely forgets its trailings when a new body, plane, or dimension is behind them. At some point, in the speaking, thinking organism of ration is granted at length a time and dimension and limitation. Imagery, weight, are instantiated upon the item of discourse, the noun, and, or topic. The question of philosophy has been about the noun. I mentioned the verbous form of the noun, the relational aspect abounding about the noun, but to reconsider the nature of any noun, in this case, variable x. To speak as if the nature of the noun, variable, is not itself reconsiderable is at issue when it comes to putting forth true contradiction as false contradiction, contradiction itself. The very nature of the variable can and does change uses, but it itself may move, migrate, change, distort, and become a new thing, a new variable such as x compared to x, or x's of differing fonts, then x as it replaces the noun of consciousness and how x can be one's own consciousness, whereby one might consider oneself to be an x-man, a mutant, an indiscernibly differing type kind of organism or thing which the universe has never known. So is X merely X? 
A contradiction is based on the idea of something being the same self, similar, in the same context, in the same manner, at the same time. But we as verbous organisms, only ever moving in time, have to subjugate our concept of time. To say that the x variable remains the same within time, from time to time, this is a trick of the mind, to say something is always self-similar. If x is both represent representative of a like-sized font and language function of its replication, namely another x, then this is all fine and good. But if x to another organism is also a replication to itself, but not merely a replication to itself, then x equals x may be a statement of personal identity to the other than it was to the first. No organism stays in stasis such as to remove time and change from life's equation. Not when attempting to maintain the idea of identity. X does not equal X, as the second X is certainly not the first. So this moves one to the principle of identity, which allows the caveat to identity to be understood by name, by noun, without losing itself into the milieu of future difference and all difference altogether. The madman who finds the oneness of the universe finds that they exist in stasis, in only the appearance of change, a movement of time. There is no place to go and nothing to do. The transmission of language requires that one know that others speak amongst themselves apart from oneself. One believes that this is happening. The evidence is in how information, secret information, can travel through the grapevine of population. The cohesion of reality is based upon the notion that some facts of our physical organism's relationship to the earth is constant and uniform. Religious side note. Latter-day Saints, a.k.a. Mormons, believe that one day a man will become a god over his own planet. At a certain level of enlightenment, when one elevates their consciousness and sees that all is merely data sets, some of importance and sympathy and some outside of that realm, that all become one, and that they become the center of that oneness. They become god and commander of their world captain of their ship. Perhaps they don't move mountains at a whim, but perhaps the mountain gets moved in accordance to their wish. Deontologic rules or rule systems seem to be overarching our beings, guides, constraints, or limitations, or at least a perception of such, such as splicing analytic truths from synthetic truths and pointing to neither. Deontologic rules are analytic in that they describe a contained subject, i.e. men must wear collared shirts in the office, and also be a tangent to the world, the world of human behavior within business settings, performing business practices. Deontologic rule systems lay outside and aside the analytic synthetic dichotomy. One can have global power, which, like their eyeball's blind spot, may be hidden away and apart from the individual, such that the actions of this hidden power be the individual's oversight of their own doings. An ongoing irony which God is more than capable is that if, when one feels like a free, outbound spirit, and center of their world and captain of their ship, God, a.k.a. the powers that be, can show you that they still dominate one's whole unfolded being. When one's mind is on an item, for whatever reason, there is that item, that referent to the idea that your mind is focused upon. Then your mind can look away without the eyes moving, the eyes can look away and the mind stay upon the supposed referent. So there is the item. Then there is the coming back to the item in focus. 
in one instance. There is the item, and there it is again. In the next instance, there is the item, then there is some other thought and sense. Then there is the reapproach to the item, the refocusing upon the item, the re-registering of the item. One case is the item and the item, the identity intact. The next case is the item and then the emergence of the item again. The first case, the member of this set of itself. In the second case, it's the item in a set with a memory of itself. The remembering of the set, the, same, the self same set. Surely these cases are not the same. Surely the method of how one is at the case, one in one case, is different than the method of getting back to the case in the second case. The shaman's creed, to remember in an instance what he has traveled through to reach himself in and as the cosmos. The reduction of one's considerations and words to primitives I don't like triangles, but I like sides. Item X in appearance, or item X in and of itself, these are aspects. Jordan Peterson on the Mark Stein Show video about at 41 minutes to talk about Derrida, saying that Derrida is possibly the most dangerous of the philosophers of the last 40 years. Assault on categories of thought. And that he says that the whole purpose of categorization is for exclusion. The statement, if Derrida made it, is not political in nature per se, yet thoughtful. Peterson continues from here to categorization is the basis for cognition as an assertion and described notions of what is the case, a.k.a. the truth of the matter about cognition. Then Peterson belittles Derrida's work and Derrida by attempting to surmise Derrida's meaning, and then Peterson makes the outlandish association, namely that Derrida has basically now made the claim that thought itself is an agent of oppression. Then Peterson says that this is absurd, which by Peterson's own claim about Derrida is absurd. I would like to exclude Peterson at this point, yet he's already categorically been included into my knowings. First and third person linguistic uses are both different and both the same. In what domain are these the same? Sam is so important. Sam should always be taken seriously, says Sam. All fallacies may be claimed as the case, but don't have to be held in a pejorative fashion. Hegel's Science of Logic quote, On this point, formal thinking lays down for its principle that contradiction is unthinkable, but as a matter of fact, the thinking of contradiction is the essential moment of the notion. Formal thinking does in fact acknowledge contradiction. Only it at once looks away from it, and in saying that it is unthinkable, it merely passes over from it into abstract negation. How does the human organism deal with the not operator in language? And why have people insisted upon making general and special categories of lingual devices or function such that the word not, being of a special category, seems to only function as a type of negation or rejection of another category, term, or item of discourse. In what case is the word not used synonymously with the word non, or meant to only negate an item in part and not in whole? In part and not in whole. Here we have this sentence, whereby the part, but not, in whole, may refer to mere limitations built up by the rules of lingua itself, but have no referent in the real world, 
or if it does have a referent in the real world, in some cases a distinguishment, being the part of the whole, and the whole would not be distinguishable. Namely, we could speak of a cookie being even in part and yet not in the whole, but could also speak of a new car which is considered whole and then scrape a bit of paint and steel or material from the car in a hidden area. The fact that the car is now but a part and not a whole would be a true statement, but absurd to consider in any real referential way in this manner. This type of discourse is merely a discourse in testing another individual's logical aptitude based on the presumption that they should only be examined with how they themselves relate to current formal logic, and with the world of words and absolutes, such that their consideration itself about wholes are rounded off and discreetly categorically in the formal logical sense, but outside of this type of discourse of language and logic, wholeness of an item with a referent may echo back into their folk approach to logic, such that to refer to a whole might assume a non-pure, non-complete category, with non-complete exclusion, apart and away from other categories, such that to speak of logic about whole cars with a tiny hidden scratch as now being but a part car would yield an eyebrow lift, or a, what are you, stupid or something? Absolutes are walled-off language games which only take their meaning in thought rules, such as having a child follow the rule, never talk to strangers, being abided by for only a limited period of time before a violation is ad admitted via caveat, tested against the rule giver and eventually occurs. This type of language rule, which will have a breaking point, is where the follow-up phrase rules are made to be broken, comes from. Caveats in logic are toyed with, at first the distinction between speaking of discrete categories of thought and making them absolute will bound the discourse supposedly to a domain where totality and negations and definite identicals are required and expected to be followed in order to make one's argument airtight, so to speak. An illustration of items being distinct from information, a professor touted the idea that an apple, Professor Anton, Professor Corey Anton, touted the idea that an apple can be cut up into parts and shared by only a finite number of people receiving a piece of the apple before the apple is no more. Yet the professor continued, if I say the word apple, well the word apple can be divided up indefinitely. On the surface, I felt that the professor's point was well made and substantiated. Yet I looked for the caveat. I pushed back. I pushed back against the professor that he was speaking the word. Could that he speaking the word could be limited, because he could only speak it so many times before he tired, and could only speak it to so many ears which would always be limited, and hence finite, such that the information contained in the word apple was not indefinite. He was upset at this claim and did not respond to my saying this, but because he spoke about an example of himself speaking the word apple opposed to just saying the restorability of the word apple, I was able to find a means of reducing his claim. If he had said generally that information is indivisible because of indefinite iteration and reiterability, I may have accepted his thesis. Or I may have abstracted further that all humans speaking the word or reading the word or using the word apple or their native tongue's referent to apple would still have its limit if one assumed that humans would cease and no, one, and no other consciousness 
would make the referring word. Or I may have attacked the use of the word divisibly altogether as a misappropriate word for the topic of comparison. Paragraph. Difference and sameness in soliloquy. Most pine trees that are indoors are seen, called and assumed to be Christmas trees, where pine trees outside are merely trees. So that the identity changes when the context of environment shifts. Word logic here, logic is ambiguous, it can mean both the theory of an investigation and the subject of an investigation. Graham Priest. Priest speaks on logic as theory of an investigation, where I prefer to linger on the investigation part. Use it as a backdrop and appeal to it for inclusion when delving into logic as a subject, especially when the sub-subject is of logical explosion proper. It seems that the quest for of the contrarian in the manner of identity itself, whereby A does not equal A, is one where the stasis that defines sameness by Aristotelian definition is always under attack, where the A on the left by merely being on the left is necessarily different than the A on the right, and that they are not substitutable, and also substitutable, such that their definition of being alike or the same is never not in question. Difference on the other hand, difference on the other hand, amongst any item or thing or idea, but approaching it with items that are held together in grouped clumps of sameness, is the beginning of the game for the contrarian. For even for me to speak about difference, I have to have at least a raft or a module of accepted definitions which I personally and communally can use and accept as self-identical in order to examine every atomic lingual bit and denote how it is not self-same like itself within the realm of its unique difference. Sameness is always an ironic... Pardon. Sameness is always as ironic as it is paradoxical in that when language speakers mean to clarify with unity and orientation of so same ideas which are supposed to be accepted as same in all perspectives, interpretations, orientations, and disambiguations, some new variable or consideration. Perspectives, insinuation, and consideration raises which reveal that the level of agreement about the unified film of agree field of agreed upon usage and supposed samenessness reveals or discloses its limit. And here, at this point, when some difference comes to light, it is looked over and not brought to bear, for then the difference is focused upon, expounded upon, and exploited. On one hand, is a sense of ultimate unity and oneness and boundedness to the conceived purity of truth, where difference is only for utility's sake. An insinuation of common perspective rises, which reveals the level of agreement of a unified field. The unified field is agreed upon as subject-object topic and reveals its limit. The other people seeking strictly differences fall into a religious Babylon, where all languages and all and one's own language lead them to infinite atomized non-definition, and their very mind and mode of thinking fall into a fluid flood of Babylon nonsense and state of madness. This is what is assumed about one's mind when logical explosion occurs from which some strata or acceptance from within the mad person has to, has to, must become self-similar. If even out of the sake of the organism's need to survive, an emotional creature parallels some primordial sense from infinite differences and infinite relativism 
in order to call and define some semblance of acceptable sameness from which to structure through the madness and backtrack to at least a base level of rationality, measure, identity, and discourse. To get back to rationality again, let me quote Graham Priest's paper called Logical Disputes here about if endorsing contradictions undercuts rationality itself here. The answer is simple. Accepting two inconsistent theories, say T1 and T2, is indeed a possibility. It amounts to accepting the theory T1 unifies with T2 or in union with T2. If this is a serious possibility, it is one of the theories on the table and should be evaluated in the same way as other theories. In general, however, the theory is likely to have little to recommend it. If either of the theories is based on, the, on explosive logic, the collective theory is trivial. Here I must insist that humans tend to want to always have a stake in it. And by it, I mean a ground. For if one grants explosion and grants triviality, it seeming, is seemingly upon the rational thinker is a type of doom. That of being, being sucked in, sucked irrevocably into quicksand. So by accepting logical explosive theories at all and making all trivial, one is enamored, maroon, and fails. And yes, this is the case of one's rationality and one's framework of rationality, and it is precisely my job to allow this to happen. And why would I endorse and want this allowance to happen, especially to rationalities? Well, it is so that they fall away from adherence to the world without losing their biological life in the process, but merely their mind as they knew it. When one embraces explosion and grants all triviality, they have passed the Rubicon of sanity into insanity. From here they are lost in the mind and must slave, succumb, and as Islam might demand, submit to all the whims of the universe, for submission to all that is, all the squeaks and squacks and barks and chirps will pattern here and fade there. All demons and frights will abound and all sincere gestures and kind glances will be bivalently read into as attractive, then repulsive, and vice versa. And once humanity will absorb all considerations at lightning speed, as it will have no bulwark to stave off the onslaught of never-ending datum. From here, which is the mirror of the philosophical doctor al candidate, one comes to consider the minutia of the world, but by consider I mean first that they, their bodily organism wallow in the shape, jabberwocky, as the mind is all but lost, finding wave patterns and strata of wave patterns abounding about and through their organism, such that they, the sense of the self, the semblance of the self, or I, being merely now a locus of experience, in illitity, reading minds from another time and away from its center, must, like a drowning victim, swim to surface where up is felt. One must feel what it is to think in basic terms, terms that an in utero infant senses of its mother's heartbeat relative to their own, and make a strata of sense and combination here to force an emotional sense of value out of all of this infinity meaning like data bits to remake combinations of sense like caring for only the iron dust one's emotional magnet can extract from the sand pile and lamenting all particles that didn't adhere but then taking care of only that which one's animal organism could pull from the sandbox, make it important, name it, call it, its grouping of iron dust, 
a strata, a type, or a kind. Buckling out from within, from the deepest of emotional empty confines, is what the this doctor ordered. Here is the rebirth of the soul, but this path is one of distraught dispendency and yearning and becoming once again, not one of anchored self-reading, stickering a stick in the path along the way. My path is to leave the ground and fly in the mind, allow the explosive and the trivial, allow flight of fancy, but try here not to kill another, where morals are now merely in the mind of the solipsist, where one, you, some, kill others as well as part of themselves as they are free to do so, where others resurrect a retaining wall which echoed the morals of the ground. These new walls may look similar to the memories of the old walls, hence demolished. And here below I rewaft into the wake of the process of reawakening where from a different angle. The waves of geometric enlightenment found within the structure of their mind and being could be echoed in relating to uniform architecture where order is exemplified in the realm of those whose aesthetic prefer absolutes and similarity. And wild, wicked, fauve, crispicular, morphing, and mutable, obscure and obfuscated, transitional, watery swamp and marsh bends and turns of unclarity of mind, is the land that echoes the flickering of a flame and the atmosphere of respiration. This is the realm of those who are primitive and hold little need nor utility for articulation, nor denoting similar or self-same any trace of common reiterated habits is not to be looked upon as the same, like no two inhales are of the same depth with the same amount of molecules entering nor exiting the body or entering into the bloodstream than the inhalation before. Every difference is known and all is anew. Such is the type, kind of speech and relationships to logic and definition, axioms and absolutes. The yin-yang betwixt these domains is at hand within philosophy and human behavior. Between that, the sharpening and loosening, and how we may prefer structure and order in one way here, and disorder, discord, and chaos there. This is exactly the battle between context and difference, and the drive to demand structure, order, agreement, and sameness. This is the fight between identities, identicals, and equivalences with variance, difference, and contradiction. When I am one who seeks to dismantle and show difference, I defame the philosophers and people of order by questioning why they are on a truth quest at all and accuse them of being neurotic because they are on one. Only ever in approximation or in hubris of claiming the truth. Here let me quote Graham Priest again from the same paper. Note that to reject one theory in favor of another is not to accept its negation. Theories do not have negations. If a theory is finitely at atomizable, the conjunction of the axioms has a negation. But even to reject a single sentence, A, is not to be identified with accepting A, Rejecting A and accepting not A, for some reason A. With or without realizing it, they accept both A and not A for some A. A for A for tiori, A for tori, they do not reject A. Moreover, uttering a sentence of the form not A may indicate a rejection of A. It may not. That just depends on what kind of speech act is being performed. Assertions or denial, orthodoxy notwithstanding, these are distinct kinds of speech 
as are questions of commanding. The utterance of one and the same sentence can, of course, constitute distinct speech acts. If I utter, the door is open, then, depending on the context, this could be an assertion, a command, or a question. Like watching myself as a trend line on a stock market chart, with an awareness of my supporting lines and indicators of my movement, which I denote as predictors and indicators for forecasting the probability of a change in direction, perhaps an upswing into a bullish trend after one more drop in a bearish downtick. And it is here and now I drop the fight against the truth seekers and those who prefer, prefer order through acceptance of sameness, yet until I make my upswing, I will not abide with this order, and I develop an internal war against the incoming order. Religious side note, I may intoxicate or break a rule or a law or overindulge sin without seeing it as a sin, as sinning is more or less what my internal state witnesses as myself when I see the trend predictors indicating a soon-to-come downswing into the bearish market, and I watch me begin to disdain order and allow myself to ear note. Emote. I went so far recently to argue with a samer, one who believes that identity remains in the face of entropy, who was denoting that identity is indexed on a timeline, that the idea of identicals, which were being discussed at that moment, were identical to the identicals which were necessarily contextually different than the previous conversation that we had, where the topic at hand was about identicals. It was quite clear that the topic abounding about identical types of conversations was imbued with much difference. The scalings of difference can lead one to see themselves in the abyss like a fractal kaleidoscope which reorders itself into a new fractal fractured type of pattern, extending into and out of such an abyss, a torrent of twisting towards or away from the motley shape and color clusters maintain a shifting self-sameness. Side note on coming of age. Before the abyss looks back at you, and yourself believed to be a hunter becomes the hunted, especially if one is a virgin to this grand psych spiritual expose, they feel a great tremble inside themselves, and then their character is expressed. How they die or how they live after this mythic event defines their entrance into mature adulthood beyond their social legal claim of adulthood. This ends this reading of Embedded Contradiction, an issuance of dissonance into contemporary philosophy, an introduction to modular truth by Mike Fale.